All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are back. I'm Amanda Williams, and I'm here with Jim Zobel. And today we're going to be talking about the friendship and working relationship between Douglas MacArthur and Manuel Quezon, the first president of the Commonwealth of the Philippines. Now, over the course of nearly four decades, they developed a very strong but also very complicated relationship. Um, um, that relationship had a major impact on the Second World War's Philippine campaign of 1941 to 1942, and it also had an impact on the future of the Philippines after liberation. So, Jim, let's just get right to it today. Tell us a little bit about Manuel Quezon's background. Well, uh, he was born in 1878, and he's born in a place called Baylor, and that's in the Tayabas region of the Philippines. It's down on the southeast coast of Luzon, which is the main island in the Philippines. And he's born during the Spanish occupation. They had been there for about 400 years. Uh, so he sees all the uh, oppression as well as racism of the Spanish at that time. At about age 10, uh, he goes to school at... Uh, the Colegio de San Juan de Latran. Uh, his dad was like a uh, in the Spanish army. He was a sergeant in the Spanish army, but he was also a teacher there. Um, and so they have all these relationships uh, with with all the Spanish overseers, like the the church as well as the Guardia Civil that are there in that area. Uh, plus, there's a lot of uh, brigands, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, being waylaid in the in the mountains behind them. So it's kind of a you know, it's a very peaceful uh, bring up in, in Baylor because they have a Guardia Civil section there and all the people will defend the area, but around the surrounding areas, it can be pretty dangerous. And so whenever he goes anywhere, his dad has to go with him and they carry a shotgun. He's one of the few people that has a, a weapon at the time, but he goes to school for about uh, seven, eight years. And at about 18, which is uh, about 1895, 96, he comes back to, to Baylor uh, and there, he runs into full force into that Spanish occupation because there's a, a Spanish uh, officer there who wants the girls, you know, and he gets uh, Filipinos and puts the pressure on them, you know, you get me these girls or else I'm going to throw you in jail or, you know, uh, commit you as Katipunan, which was the, you know, resistance group to the Spanish. And that's what this one guy does. He, he, uh, he uh, they list uh, Quezon as this Katipunan, which is a revolutionary. And uh, I think Kazan was, you know, in step with them, but he wasn't a member of them at that time. But the thing is, is uh, Kazan had the feeling that, you know, he had to kill this guy or else the guy was going to take the girl, go after his family. And so he like, he waylays him and ambushes him one night. But when the police come to arrest him, they don't uh, look to it that night that he, you know, bashed this guy. They said, where were you on this night? And and uh, he said, you know, I was home, which they were able to prove. And so he got thrown into court, was supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, go before a judge before this, but his dad is able to get him out of that. And so then uh, he immediately is enrolled into Santa Tomas Law School. He's probably about 17, 18 years old at this time. And that's when the Americans show up. And he's there at Santo Tomas. Uh, the day of the Battle of Manila Bay, he runs down to the beach at, at Manila and watches the Spanish fleet burn uh, right there. And when the Americans come in, of course, the Americans get Emilio Aguinaldo, who had been exiled to Hong Kong in 96 uh, after Rizal and the, it was executed. And they had this you know, mini revolution then. And uh, the Dewey brings him back. There's the whole... Uh, Filipinos versus the Spanish, and then the Americans take over, won't let the Filipinos in on it. They're going to totally control the place now. And then Quezon himself joins the revolutionaries at that point. Uh, he goes up into central Luzon. He's only 18 or 19. He sees those last few organized battles um, at uh, Angeles, Orion. That's when uh, Arthur MacArthur's division is able to uh, finally end organized resistance. And then he goes with this uh, General Thomas Moscardo down to uh, Batan because there's no uh, Americans there yet. But uh, from 1899 to 1901, the Americans will come in there, occupy that whole area. Uh, all these guys are living among villages. There's about 300 of them. Quezon gets real sick, gets malaria. And then Mas they hear that Aguinaldo has been captured. 
And Moscardo, the general, knows that Kazon has got malaria, knows he's real sick. He says, I want you to go and turn yourself in and find out if Aguinaldo has really uh, surrendered. And so Kazon goes down to Marvelis. He meets an American Lieutenant Miller. And he's like, I wonder if I should tell this guy, you know, that of what I'm up to. And he finally does. He says, I'm, I'm, you know, was sent by them to find out if Aguinaldo uh, surrendered. And uh, the thing is, is Miller gets a boat there that day, carries him from Maravellas to Manila, and he goes right to Malacanon Palace where Arthur MacArthur is. And Arthur MacArthur has Aguinaldo in a room there. And, uh, and Kazon goes in there, you know, I've, I've been, they know why he's there. And he goes to Arthur MacArthur and through an interpreter says, you know, is Aguinaldo real here? And, and he said, Arthur MacArthur just pointed to the room across the hall and Kazon goes in there and, you know, there's his hero, uh, you know, under, under captivity. And he sees the effect, you know, that has a big effect on, but also the magnanimous attitude of Arthur MacArthur has a big effect on, on Kazon at that point. Now, they put him into jail for about four months, you know, because he was a revolutionary, uh, but they let him out. He goes back to Santa Tomas Law School. The thing is, the Americans shorten the course from seven years to four years uh, for a law degree or three years. And so Kazon had already fulfilled his time, so he immediately becomes a lawyer. Goes back down to Baylor and becomes good friends with this guy, Colonel Bandholtz, who's head of the constabulary, which is like the, the uh, civil... Uh, police force for the Philippines. It's run by Americans, uh, but the, the Filipinos, it's kind of like the old Guardia Civil, you know, um, and goes back there, starts a law practice. Bandholtz is really helpful with them as Tayabas uh, area controller. And then after Bandholtz, there's this guy named Colonel James Harbord. And Harbord is going to be head of the constabulary as well. And he helps Kazon as well as Bandholtz did. And Kazon gets elected to be the first, the governor of Tayabas area. Um, and that's that's in about 1906, and he's he's only about 20, 28 years old at, at this point. And then um, in 1907, the Americans start the National Assembly. He becomes part of that. He becomes the leader of the Nacionalista Party. 1909, he goes on this round-the-world trip, goes and meets Kerensky in Moscow, goes to Berlin, goes to Paris, and then comes to Washington and meets Teddy Roosevelt. And he's now a resident commissioner. He's in the United States the, the whole time and uh, from about 1909 till about 1916 with the Jones Act. And then he comes back to uh, the Philippines and he's like the, you know, pretty much the leader of, of the political parties. And he'll run the Philippine Senate because the Jones Act makes a bicameral uh, legislature in the, in the Philippines about that time. And so that's where he is about... 1916 uh, at that point he's pretty much the leader of the of the you know the philippine uh, nationalista uh, party mm -hmm. and the independence movement to get independence from the united states so when does he meet douglas macarthur and what do we know about their first contact well both of them talk about it in their memoirs um uh, Kazon's memoirs as well as douglas macarthur's memoirs and MacArthur was the district uh, engineer for Manila as a first lieutenant in like 03, 04. Uh, he had been working down on the Southern Islands, but uh, by 04, he was in Manila itself. And he had written a pamphlet for the constabulary on scouting and engineering. And Harvard really liked it. And so he starts, uh, you know, puts together this uh not friendship, but military, you know, comradeship with MacArthur, takes him to Army-Navy Club one night, and there's Kazon, and there's Sergio Osmania, the first two presidents of, of the Philippines. And we don't know much about the meeting, um, but, I mean, if, if, you know, if Kazon had met Arthur MacArthur, it definitely would have come up in the, in the conversation. But we know that when MacArthur finally comes back in 22, they immediately strike that, that relationship up again. You know, did they have correspondence between 03 and 19? We don't really know. You know, all MacArthur's stuff gets destroyed. Um, but we know they that when they come back in 22, Kazon is very instrumental in, in helping MacArthur get set up there and, mm -hmm. and everything else. Okay. So MacArthur's back for a second tour of duty in the Philippines from 1922 to 1925. And then he's back again in 1928. Um, as commander of the Philippine Department. And biographers really point to that time in the 1920s as the time when their friendship deepened. 
So what are they both doing in the Philippines during this time? And, and what do we know about the deepening of that relationship? Well, in 22, uh, MacArthur comes out there with his new wife, Louise Cromwell Brooks, and their two uh, children. Uh, it's actually Louise's children, but MacArthur's like the stepfather. And when they get there, MacArthur meets Robert C. Richardson. He'll be a general during World War II. You know, he's got all these contacts. And MacArthur really has no job there because uh, he was uh, relieved as superintendent of West Point and sent off. People said he was exiled by Pershing because he married Louise. Uh, but they get there and he's got no job. And uh, Richardson sets up this uh, district manager of Manila. You know, and that's, it's kind of like this make-believe thing. And three months later, the War Department's like, what's going on here? And they, they assign MacArthur to the Philippine Scout Brigade. He'll command that in the Philippines. But also, Manuel Quezon uh, sets MacArthur up in Intramuros on this place called the House on the Wall. It was the old constabulary headquarters. It's Calle 1 of uh, uh, Victoria. And that will be the headquarters MacArthur has of in 22, 28. And when he comes back as Philippine military advisor, you know, and then uh, the early days of World War II, that's headquarters at Calle 1. It's destroyed now. It's destroyed during World War, World War II. But MacArthur sets up there and he is very much uh, in line with Quezon. And the thing is, is he gets a lot of resentment because there's a big colonial crowd there that believes that Quezon is uh, not subservient to the colonial you know, masters, that he's for this independence. And, and MacArthur goes out of his way to publicly show that, you know, they're equals. And MacArthur's unlike anybody else. And the thing is, is Kazan will, you know, think about, oh, these are very polite, highly educated racists, you know, for a lot of these Americans that come out there. But uh, he does, they don't think of that of MacArthur. None of them do. And that's because MacArthur constantly goes out his way and constantly has a, a lot of backstabbing, bickering going on about how he's so close with all these uh, Filipinos at the time. And so we know that the relationship really grows strong uh, during that 22-24 period. Uh, Louise and um, Douglas are very uh, much a part of the Kazan family. Louise uh, pretty much nurses back uh, Manolo Kazan from uh, sickness and death. And so they'll be very tight. When Kazan comes back to the States, uh, when World War uh, II starts, he stays with Louise for a little while, you know, the Kazan really? family. So they're close. And, and the thing is, is Louise is also very much into this social elite millionaire status because she is one. And those are the kind of people that Kazon likes to hang out with. And so they'll be in line in, in that sense. You know? Now, when they come back, when MacArthur comes back in 28, uh, Louise is now gone. And uh, he's going to be the head of the Philippine Department. That's what runs all the American and Filipino forces outside the Philippine constabulary. And MacArthur, uh, during this period, uh, Kazon is the uh, Speaker of the House of, of the legislature. Um, he's pretty much, uh, you know, controlling a lot of things that are going on. Um, very much uh, having a hard time with Leonard Wood, uh, who believes that independence should not be even, you know, talked about. Uh, and MacArthur is very close with Wood on the sense of the, how they would defend the Philippines. He's like MacArthur's mentor on, on that. But as far as the independence move, uh, they're very widespread on that in that sense. So during this period, there's also kind of a, a, a confrontation over the fact that uh, there's thousands of Japanese moving into Mindanao. And Kazan likes that because of uh, the uh, Muslim uh, community in Mindanao and the Christian communities are always fighting and the Muslims are all, and he wants the Japanese in there as another countering force to like colonize this area. Plus they bring in economic interests. Um, and this will be something that uh, will later hound him uh, and haunt him because he, he wants this at that point. But uh, from that 28, 22, 24, and then 28 to 30, it's basically them drawing very, very close to one another. I think they both see each other as up and coming. Uh, you know, Kazan has an idea or, or, and already is controlling politics. MacArthur is looking for that chief of staff position in Washington, you know, the, the highest epitome that a, a line officer can go. Uh, 
29, um, uh, Hoover had offered MacArthur chief of engineers because MacArthur had been an engineer and he turned it down because he knew if he took that, he would never get the chief of staff. And so when he does leave in 1930, it's it's because uh, Hoover has offered him that that mm -hmm. chief of staff position. But during that whole time, that that friendship really, really, really grows. Now, you mentioned MacArthur's interest in the chief of staff position, but in 1929, the New York Times um, credits the friendship between MacArthur and Kazon as the driving force behind an effort to make MacArthur the next governor general of the Philippines. Um, they're, they're not even talking about chief of staff or any other position in the future. Um, do you think Kazon really wanted to see MacArthur as the next governor general? Um, do you think MacArthur wanted that role at all? I don't think that MacArthur did. That article that comes out in the New York Times, they say that MacArthur wanted the governor generalship because he saw it as a stepping stone to the presidency. But the thing is, there's no evidence um, that MacArthur ever, you know, voiced anything like that. Nothing before World War II, you know, he ever says, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to be president one day or anything like that. As well, there's no evidence that Kazan really pushed for MacArthur to be governor general. He was pushing for Stinson. In 1927, when Leonard Wood dies, you know, the, the governor general out there, Kazan goes back to Washington to lobby for Henry Stimson. Now, he thinks, he knows that uh, Stimson is very much anti-independence, but he also knows that uh, Stimson is not a racist, you know, that he's very much understands uh, Filipino culture and, you know, thinks that they are equals. But the thing is, is that in 29, the stock market crashes, you know, the depression is going to start coming on. Kazan's worried if they get their independence, uh, they'll lose that free trade status with the United States and they'll be totally, uh, you know, cut off. They'll lose any money that's coming into the Philippines. And so uh, when he's approaching Stimson, you know, uh, he wants him to come out there, but he's also now really worried about, you know, maybe we should stay under the Americans wing for a little while longer while this, mm -hmm. you know, this, this thing is going on. So I really think that, that he was more locked on to uh, Stimson. If they had chosen MacArthur, I don't think he would have had a problem with that. But uh, D. Clayton James talked about it, and he said he thought that that report came from probably like a, a Filipino gossip reporter, you know, who okay. was hearing, hearing things in Manila and then just, you know, putting them in the, in the gossip page of the of the New York Times, because James said he, you know, he couldn't he couldn't find any evidence of it, but there's a lot of evidence of Kazan wanting Stimson, you know, at that at that time. That's really interesting. Um, so MacArthur does become chief of staff of the U.S. Army, and as he fights the Army's budget battles during the early years of the Great Depression, what is Kazan doing? Well, this uh, we know that he's Kazan has tuberculosis. His mom had tuberculosis. Um, he's racked with it uh, quite a bit. We know he's out quite a bit during those early years. Um, but there's also something else going on because this is right when uh, the Roosevelt administration is putting forward these uh, acts uh, that are going to lead to Philippine independence. And in 1933, they had what they called the the Hawes uh, cutting. Uh, act. And that was going to grant the Philippines independence, but it didn't have a lot of the uh, trade stipulations that Kazan was looking for. And the thing is, his rivals and his contemporaries, Manuel Rojas, who will be the third president of the Philippines, and Osmania, who will be the second, they go to Washington and lobby for this bill, you know, this Hawes Cutting Act. Kazan knows if they go there and they get all the glory for getting in, you know, he's out of the picture. But the thing is, is the Philippine legislature has the right to veto the act that Congress passes about, you know, their independence or anything like that. So while Osmania and Rojas are in Washington pushing for this thing, uh, Kazan's defeating it back in the Philippines. 
And so when the Hawes Cutting Act goes through, the Philippine legislature says no, and Quezon has put all these, you know, economic thing, you know, which are real considerations uh, because Americans who lose their interest in the Philippines are also going to all of a sudden going to slap a lot of tariffs on everything, and you know, the Philippines will be out of it. And so when uh, Osmania and Rojas come back, the Hawes Cutting uh, uh, Bill doesn't work. Then. Ro uh, uh, Kazon goes to America and supports this Tidings McDuffie Act. And that is going to be the act that will pass that gives the Filipinos their independence in 1946. And so Kazon has really positioned himself to be, you know, the leader in the Philippines because now he's the hero who's gotten this contract for independence. And that comes in about 1934, right when MacArthur's, you know, term as, as chief of staff is, is coming to a close. MacArthur during the whole time, as you said, is, is fought, fighting the depression. There's no money. He's trying to keep the officer corps whole, which we've talked about, you know, in previous things. But the main thing was he was under the belief that if if, if things went haywire, he, he had to restock the Philippines. That was going to be the one place that, you know, as chief of staff, he thought that they had to. There, Hawaii and the Panama Canal. Um, but there's no money for it. Nothing goes into it. And then it's coming to his his time as the end of uh, chief of staff, and that's when Kazon approaches him, you know, about about defense in the Philippines. Okay, so with the passing of the Tidings McDuffie Act, and then Kazon's election as president of the Philippine Commonwealth, Kazon then turns his attention to this idea of how the Philippines will defend itself, to the idea of a Philippine military. Um, he needs a military advisor, and he's going to look to Douglas MacArthur to be that advisor. Walk us through MacArthur's appointment as military advisor to the Philippine Commonwealth. Okay. Um, well, in 34, when uh, Kazong came back, you know, for that bill, uh, he goes to see MacArthur there. And bluntly just comes out and says, can the Philippines be defended? See, because the tid under Tidings McDuffie Act, the United States military would still uh, cover for the Philippines. They would be their defender. But once they become independent, the, the Americans will pull out. They'd have to pull out all their bases and things like that. Now, so Kazan's really worried. The Japanese have made all these uh, moves into Manchuria. Uh, he's worried that the, the Philippines are just sitting there ripe for the picking. So when he goes to MacArthur, MacArthur says, yeah, they can be defended. And that's what uh, MacArthur and Leonard Wood had worked out. They would need some sort of uh, style like Switzerland has, where you have a citizen's uh, class that's trained to go. MacArthur says, you know, we'll divide it in 10 districts. We'll train 4,000 a year. You know, it's it basically uh, the idea is, is it's almost like CCC camps because when they go out there and, and they finally uh, get them out there, it's basically they're teaching them hygiene and things like that. So what happens is is once MacArthur, you know, he agrees that he'll go out there, then uh, President uh, Roosevelt agrees with it, uh, Secretary of War Dern agrees with it, but they tell MacArthur he'll be the chief of staff, four-star general, all the way up until December of 1937. And so everybody's going to Manila to see the inauguration, Secretary of War Dern, uh, Secretary of State, all these different people. And uh, MacArthur's going to go out there for that, too. And he leaves in October and it's, un you know, they'll release this press release uh, when MacArthur gets there saying he'll be the chief of staff till December. That's all, you know, on there. But as soon as MacArthur gets on the train, Roosevelt writes in there that he's been demoted back to a major general, you know, that he uh, that he's not going to be the chief of staff. And right before that, uh, Roosevelt had had him up at Hyde Park in New York, and he offered MacArthur the governor general or the new high commissioner, because with the Tidings McDuffie Act, they were getting rid of governor general, you become a high commissioner. And he offers it to MacArthur, and MacArthur says, well, if I can stay in the army, uh, then I'll go ahead and do it. But, you know, the army says, no, there's no way that you can do that. So the high commissionership went to Frank Murphy. So MacArthur, again, feels totally like Roosevelt only, the only thing he ever does is lie, you know, instead of tell the truth. And that's the way he believes of, of Roosevelt for the rest of his life, um, but mainly because of, of, of that circumstance. So MacArthur goes out there, um, takes his mother with him, you know, uh, she, he's 
she dies like a month later, uh, right after he gets there, he takes Eisenhower with him and he takes uh, James Ord, who's a good uh, friend of Eisenhower's. They were both classmates at West Point. And these guys will come out there and start this mission to build. MacArthur says you need, you know, at least 5 million pesos a year, which the Philippines will have to provide. We're going to need total support by the United States as far as providing weapons, providing all this stuff. I need, you know, he wanted to be chief of staff when he got there so he could make a uh, plans to order that the Philippine department out there would be the guys who trained all the army. But when Roosevelt cut that out, MacArthur had no grounds to be telling the Philippine department what to do whatsoever. And so that's how he gets out there. And that's how he gets to be um, you know, the, the, the head of this military mission out there. Uh, Again, he's very much, uh, you know, aligned with with Kazan. Everything is 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 very uh, well, you know, uh, in that in that early period, thirty five, mm -hmm. thirty six. It's a another interesting time in their relationship. Um, Nineteen thirty eight, MacArthur names Kazan the godfather of his only child, Arthur okay. MacArthur. Um, but I think as you get into the later part of the nineteen thirties, there's also some growing tension between the two. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, a lot of goofy things happen. Um, they go through 1937 and Kazan is still very all on board with, with everything they're doing. And then in January of 1937, that high commissioner, that Frank Murphy guy, he gets a hold of um, Kazan in the Philippines because he had gone back to United States in 36, and he tells Kazon, Roosevelt wants to have a meeting with you. Uh, we want to talk about Philippine defense. You know, you guys need to come out here to uh, the United States. And Ro or Kazon gets MacArthur to go with them. And so they both uh, get on the, the ship. They go to San Francisco. And when they get to San Francisco, there's no invitation to the White House. There's no nothing. There's nobody there to meet them whatsoever. And then they make the trip to New York because that's where they were supposed to meet Frank Murphy, who's going to set up this meeting with uh, I, or, uh, Kazon and Roosevelt. And when they get there, Murphy's gone. He's down in Florida on vacation. So they're like, what's going on? They still have no word from Roosevelt or anybody. So MacArthur leaves Kazon in New York, goes down to Washington, goes to the White House and says, I, you know, I, I need to see the president. I, you know, what's what's going on with this? And the uh, the staff are like, oh, he's too busy uh, to see you right now. And MacArthur says, I got it. I insist. I got to have two minutes for this. And this is ridiculous. And he goes in there and is supposed to have two minutes with Roosevelt because they finally agreed it. And he spends two hours in there. He's like, you've got the Japanese running rampant all over the Pacific, you know, in China and whatnot. You've got an uh, experiment going on there with this new commonwealth. We're going to give this country their freedom. Every Asian country out there is watching this, and you're not going to even meet with the guy when he comes here. You know, and, and Roosevelt was like, I don't know what Frank Murphy was talking about. I don't know anything about this. And finally, he agrees to have a lunch with Kazon. And Kazon comes down there and Kazon goes in there and first thing he starts talking about is we have to have immediate independence right now. And uh, if you read Parade, they talk about how when as soon as Kazon got to New York, he was going to all the papers saying we have to have independence, independence. And, you know, did this tick off Roosevelt that he didn't want to, you know, see him at that point? We don't really know. Um, but the thing is, is they had come there really to sell that Philippine defense and they come there and they find a great many people in the War Department are against it. Most of the people in the Roosevelt administration are against it. They say all that is going on is MacArthur is a warmonger trying to stir up the Japanese, trying to stir up everybody, and that this is going to be a failure. We need to leave the Philippines. And this is after they had promised them everything, you know, back in 35. And so they leave Washington. Kazan goes on around the world. A trip. This guy's into lavish parties, uh, you know, spending sprees, um, and it's, it's, it's a parade called a personal ego trip. But MacArthur goes back. He's got his new wife, Jean. They go to live at the at the Manila Hotel there. And when MacArthur gets back, about three months after he gets there, all of a sudden he gets word from Washington. 
you have to return to the United States. You, the military mission in the Philippines is being relieved. So what happened, you know, in Washington that a couple of months later, all these people are like, get him out of there because they don't want this military mission. They don't want the Philippines built up. A lot of them don't even want independence out there. You've got Japanese propaganda, you know, saying that y'all are a bunch of warmongers and everything. And all of a sudden here comes this message, you have to leave. And MacArthur, you know, is just flabbergasted about what is going on. And uh, basically he says, I'm going to retire and I'm going to stay here in the Philippines. And, uh, and Kazan gives him uh, the rest of the, the military mission. He'll pay his salary, everything. They'll stay there in Manila at the Manila Hotel. But this is really where things start going sour. Because now that MacArthur's retired, he's got no voice in the U.S. Army, you know, to get anything. He's got no uh, cooperation from the Philippine Department or, or anything like that. A lot of the Filipino generals are now against the military mission. And Kazan himself is starting to have serious doubts right when the Japanese are, are just going haywire all through China. So you get to 39, uh, 40, uh, and Kazan basically is wanting to get rid of MacArthur, but he can't do it personally. He can't, you know, go to Washington and say, get rid of him. And basically he just starts ignoring him and won't see him. And MacArthur finally says to him, you know, there's going to come a point when you want to see me a lot more than I want to see you. And so the break really happens there. The United States basically puts no funds in, you know, after that they put no weapons, you know, anything like that. They just, and you've got, a uh, you know, a, a lot of the army officers, even in, in the Philippines saying that, you know, that, that we've got to leave these islands immediately, you know, even though they've promised to, to defend them this whole time. And so, yeah, they do have this break uh, that happens and it'll, it'll last all the way until MacArthur is recalled to the colors, you know, because you know, after he retires in 37 um, in, in December, it's, you know, it's, it's another three and a half years till he's called back. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Japanese attack the Philippines in 1941, things are going to get a lot more complicated. Um, Kazan and MacArthur appear at odds still in some moments um, around the time of the attacks. But then sometimes it also seems that the War Department is also worried that MacArthur is siding with Kazan sometimes over U.S. interests. So what is going on here? Well, there's a lot to that. That is a very loaded question. <laughs> uh, the thing is, is like when MacArthur gets called called back, you know, even they they had break break all the time. All of a sudden, Kazan's calling him on the phone. I'm going to come over to the Manila Hotel and see you. And they meet at the entrance. It's this grand reunion. They're all excited. They all think that they can, you know, because the United States has now promised to start funneling in materiel, airplanes, troops. Uh, you know, weaponry, all that kind of stuff, and they're they're very excited about it. Um, as they move through and they start training all these people, MacArthur keeps saying, you know, we'll be ready in, in April of 42, uh, but the Japanese timetable is a lot er earlier than that. When the war starts, uh, Kazan's up in Baguio, and MacArthur is down in Manila. Uh, Kazan immediately comes back. He stops at his place at Mount Arayat, which is about halfway to Manila, and he can see the fires at Clark Field. Um, you know, if you want to know about that, see our earlier video on, on that. And then comes back and stays at Marikina in, um, uh, in, uh, right outside Manila. MacArthur is working on getting the, the forces ready after, you know, after the disastrous day of December 8th and losing most of the Air Force. The Navy is now gone. And uh, on December 12th, uh, MacArthur and Kazan finally meet for the first time since the war began. And MacArthur tells him we're you know, even though he's looking at defending on the beaches, uh, he's looking at, uh, tells Kazan, we're probably going to have to go to War Plan Orange, which is that retreat back to Bataan Peninsula, hold Corregidor, hold Manila Bay till the Navy comes and rescues him. And even says, you know, we're probably going to have to go to Corregidor. But this is 12 days before MacArthur enacts War Plan Orange. You know, he, he waits and see what sees how they do on the beaches. When it's a disaster there, he finally uh, goes for it. And this is the part where 
it looks like Kazan's got a lot of sway over MacArthur's thinking. And, you know, the, you put MacArthur in a position, it's his country. He's the president of that country. You know, MacArthur is there uh, for the defenses of, of the forces, but there's a, a lot of play. You know, they've got that compadre uh, relationship at that time. And so when they start the withdrawal into Bataan, there's all these rice stocks at Cabanatuan uh, that they could move into, into Bataan. But there's the law in the Philippines. You can't move rice out of the region it was grown in. And Kazan won't let him take the rice stock. Says, you'll be starving all of my people. So they leave all that there. As well, uh, right when the war started, the uh, American army wanted to take over the railroad system uh, to be able to shuttle supplies, use the railroads to get all those things, moving things around. And Kazan said, no, you can't have it. That's, you know, our thing. And he says, we'll put the, the Philippine constabulary in there. Well, by the 15th of December, the con Philippine constabulary had taken off and the, the trains aren't running anymore. You know, another major uh, flub at that time. Then you get into... Uh, when they get to Corregidor, Kazan, MacArthur, Sayer, the high commissioner, they're all there on Corregidor and they start getting uh, shelled from the Cavite Ternate area south of, of Corregidor on the south of Manila Bay. And uh, MacArthur wants to start doing counter battery fire to smash them out. And Kazan's saying, no, you can't do that. So, yes, he does have a lot of sway. And even uh, Buckley, who's the, the lieutenant commander that gets MacArthur out of the Philippines on the PD boats, uh, he said that 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 was the problem that uh, Kazan had this you know control over over MacArthur at that time. Even though when Kazan gets back to uh, Washington, he tells uh, Eisenhower a com completely different story. So um, yeah, there's a it's and then you get into the whole uh, you know Kazan wanting to stay, wanting to go back to Manila after they had those uh, surrender now speeches from uh, Aguinaldo and Jose Vargas who had was running the, the puppet government for the Japanese. And then uh, Kazan sends that, with MacArthur sends that February 8th message saying, uh, if we neutralize the Philippines, everybody pulls out and, you know, give us independence now, we'll be neutral. And everybody pulls out and, and you know, that just drives FDR up the roof. And now they're all thinking, we got to get him out of there. You know, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he looks like he might be ready to cave uh, at any moment. I don't think you, I think Kazan was, was, you know, in his mind, he was like, you all are just so worried about Hitler and Europe. You don't care anything about us. You know, why should I sacrifice everything, you know, when you're willing to just, you know, throw us to the lions? And so that was his whole view. You know, why, you know, the, the thing is, is they're waiting for supplies to come from America. And the first thing they hear over the radio is about all these convoys going to Russia, you know, to help them out. And so, um, Kazan is, is just you know, totally disenamored with uh, Roosevelt and the United States. So who is behind Kazan's departure from the Philippines? Is that Washington deciding that they want him out of there? Is that MacArthur deciding that it, you know, this, he needs to probably go to, you know, exile in the United States? How, how, how does that come about? Well, I've seen the messages in like January and February um, where MacArthur says, you know, at some point we're going to have to think about uh, getting Kazan off the island. Uh, Jeffrey Perret points to messages that came from Washington in uh, early January where Washington is saying they were going to have to get him out. Um, I haven't seen that, that message, uh, but he says that. So it looks like it's kind of both ways. The thing is, though, is when Kazan does leave, by submarine on the 20th of February, goes on the swordfish down to Panay. Uh, the message says they're going to reestablish the government in the Southern Philippines. You know, so when he leaves at that point, it doesn't look like he's leaving the Philippines yet. You know, like they're going down there to establish, and it's only when MacArthur uh, goes to Mindanao and sends Buckley to basically kidnap him, you know, to bring him to Mindanao to fly him to Australia. So I, I it's a, it's, a, it's a confusing issue. It looks like both of them, you know, both Washington and MacArthur knew he was going to have to get out, but it looks like MacArthur, uh, at, at the beginning, Kazan wasn't planning on getting out, you know, and it's, it's not until Buckley shows up and, and, and basically forces him onto the boat, you know, that, that, that he, he gets to Mindanao and then flies out, gets down to, 
Australia, MacArthur meets him there, and then uh, he gets an invitation from Roosevelt to come to the United States. And on April 20th, he leaves Australia. He shows up in, in uh, San Francisco. Roosevelt had sent him a special railway car, you know, very different from the 37 trip. The railway car takes him to Washington, and at the station, there's Roosevelt in the wheelchair waiting for him. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot, a lot different um, in, in, in that respect. You know, proper welcome for a head of state, even if he's just coming to start a government in exile. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what yeah. contact do MacArthur and, uh, or what contact does MacArthur and Kazan have after um, this point? Well, they're in contact all through the war. Uh, 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 Joe McMicking, who came out on the PT boats, he's a Filipino mestizo, uh, friends with Kazan. He'll be like a liaison, goes from Australia to um, wherever case he's on spends his time with the Sarano in New York and because um, he tuberculosis he's really racked with tuber and he goes down to Miami a lot and so he's also got this guy uh, Andres uh, Soriano who was head of um, uh, San Miguel Brewery and uh, he's an uh, uh, officer in the Philippines uh, as well as for the, the Americans and he'll be a liaison as well we have three giant folders of massive traffic daily between Quezon and MacArthur uh, the, the big connection is in, in uh, early 43, Kazan sends his doctor to Australia and tells MacArthur, you send him into the Philippines because I want him to go see Rojas. And this guy, Miguel Cruz, goes by submarine into Negros. The Japanese know he's there the whole time. Uh, basically, every town he goes to, the minute he leaves, the Japanese come in, arrest everyone in town. And this happens the whole way through the Philippines. It's, you know, it's like Keystone Cops kind of thing, go in one door and come out the other. And he goes to Manila and actually goes and sees Rojas in, you know, Manila and finds out all about what's going on in the occupation, about all the personalities, everything else. And this is one of the, you know, the, the main things of, of, that they'll use later when all these people are saying Rojas was a collaborator. You know, and, and no, he was, you know, he was meeting with him, telling him everything that was going on, everything that was blatantly happening under under the occupation. So um, MacArthur and, and Kazan will have a lot of uh, contact during the war before Kazan's death in August of 44. I think it's what, the 20th is his death date, you know, in a couple of days. Um, and as well, Kazan will impart upon MacArthur what he wants for the future of the Philippines after the, after the war. Mm. Now, we've talked a lot about their relationship, and um, we've talked a lot about it offline as well, and the fact that it's kind of a, a hybrid Philippine-American type of friendship or kinship. It's a social construct where loyalty is reciprocal, but there's also certain expectations that certain personal obligations exist between the two men, um, and those have to be properly fulfilled, whether they're financial, whether they're political. Um, do you want to kind of add to any of that? Yeah, well, that's that whole compadre, you know, system, which is like the, the basis of kinship in the Philippines. It's extended family. A compadre, I, I think it means godfather, you know, two fathers. Um, and, and, you know, that's the way they are because, you know, the, um, Kazan is godfather to MacArthur's you know, son, and they have that that type of relationship. You know, and, and a lot of people have said over the years, you know, that it, it comes down to you know your your obligation isn't to this or that. Your obligation is to me. You know, this is right. what you, this is what it's all about. You know, and then you know that comes into that whole executive order number one, where Kazan pays off uh, MacArthur. You know, right before he leaves the Philippines, you know, he he pays him that sum which was owed to MacArthur. But, you know, there's a lot of this, you know, kinship, you know, obligation. And the, and the Americans knew that because when MacArthur first took that contract, they knew that's what Filipinos did, you know, was bestow gifts and, and money on, you know, anybody that was there, you know, in their, in their system. Um, but it also comes down to, I think, like I was saying before, uh, when, Macar when Quezon imparts what he wants for the Philippines after, you know, that's pretty much what MacArthur does when he gets there. Uh, all those civil affairs units are Filipinos. You know, they're going to go around and, and work with the Filipinos. 
MacArthur is not going to touch the collaborators. Uh, Kazan pretty much uh, exonerated all of them, said they did what they had to do. Um, and, and so MacArthur won't touch him, even though he's got Harold Ickes and all these people in the state saying you got to execute every single one of them as well. Kazan wanted Rojas to be his successor. And everybody was saying, well, Rojas was a, a total collaborator. Well, you've got that cruise mission that proved it wasn't as well. We have all the message traffic. The three times Rojas wanted to be taken out of the Philippines on submarine. And MacArthur was like, no, you stay there. You're the best thing, you know, to be working there in the Philippines. And so when MacArthur gets to the Philippines, you know, he, he he's going to pretty much meant, not be a mentor, but he's going to look out for that. You know, that he knows Kazan wants Rojas, you know, to run the government. We we have those uh, Bonner Feller's diaries where Feller says that MacArthur was trying to get Osmania and, and Rojas to work together after the war, but knew it wasn't going to work. And um, but that's you know, that's what he did. He's he at when before he left for Japan, he had set it up, you know, the way Kazan wanted, you know, that they would have their independence and it would it would be their own and they would deal with their own matters from from World War Two. What about the succession of Osmania? Was, did MacArthur feel that that was something that Kazan wanted? I mean, obviously that well, was just set up. Well, he was happen. the vice president, you know. Right. Um, and so he, he's got to become, you know, president at that, at that point. Uh, when MacArthur gives that I shall return speech, you know, he says, with me is, is Sergio Osmania, worthy successor of the great patriot, you know, Manuel Kazan. Uh, they talk about during the war that, all the elites really went with the Japanese. It was the same thing as happened from the change from the Spanish to the Americans. You know, the elites want to protect their money. That happens in every country. Um, and they go, you know, to, to, to work with them. But the peasantry and, uh, you know, they kept their allegiance to Kazan. And mm -hmm. they kept their allegiance, you know, to, to the U.S. still. And, you know, I think that's why MacArthur throws that in that speech, you know, worthy successor of that great patriot, Manuel Quezon. It's a very weird relationship. It's a very, um, you know, but I tend to think sometimes that MacArthur thought of Quezon as, as his best friend. You know, Quezon will say that sometimes, you know, even though it's a mercurial relationship um, and, you know, they, they, they fight when Frank Murphy was that high commissioner, before he left to go back to the United States, he was really close with the Kazons as well, but not as close as MacArthur. And it kind of ticked him off, you know? And he one time was sitting there ragging on, you know, saying bad things about MacArthur to Aurora Kazon. And Aurora Kazon looked at him and just said, Mr. Murphy, you have to realize Douglas is our brother. Yeah. You know, like, you shut your mouth right now. I don't want to hear one more word, you know, and that's that whole, you know, that's, you know, he's, he's in our family, you know, and, and so they are, you know, I fought with my brothers probably more than I've fought with anybody else, but, you know, we're still brothers. Right. I tend to think they both just love the Philippines quite a bit, which probably helped knit them together. Um, and then, so. you know, the flip side of that is they could both be very charming, very elegant in society, and they probably both admired that in the other. So um, yeah. a, a very that interesting so. and, and, and very, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, I was just going to say a very interesting <laughs> and very consequential friendship for U.S.-Philippine relations. Um, any final That's thoughts on that? I think needs to be explored. I think it needs to be explored a lot more. I think, you know, that that would be a, you know, every time we do one of these, somebody calls and say, I'm going to write a book on that. So, all right, everybody, this is the one you want to write a book on. Yes, please. Um, any final thoughts on the legacy of the friendship? I wish I could have been at some of those Kazon parties. They sounded like they were out of control. Sounds like it. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us again. We'll be back again soon.